When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Kitties, it is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, here to bring you another episode of Twisted Tea Time. For tonight's tea, I am drinking Thorny Rose, a red blend created from special grape tea in the Columbia Valley. And that grape tea, that's an alternative fact. It tastes of black cherry and vanilla. And it's perfect for when you want a bottle of wine to consume on your own. Anyway, I would like to remind you all to please support this show by going on to Stitcher, iTunes, or Google Play and giving us a positive review. You'd be surprised how much that actually helps. Self-aggrandizement aside, this episode marks the third of our four-episode series focused on H.P. Lovecraft's work. And tonight, we are continuing our exploration of both the Randolph Carter stories as well as the Dream Quest cycle. Given time isn't as much of a precious commodity as it usually is, I shall start things off Fairly quickly, with the next story, chronologically at least, of Lovecraft's alter ego, Randolph Carter. The story itself is more a defense or an explanation of a common trope in Lovecraft's work. That of having elements arise that his protagonists can neither name or truly describe, usually resulting in their descent into madness. Well, one of Carter's friends questions the value in such a trope, and thus they begin to discuss the unnameable. We were sitting on a dilapidated 17th century tomb in the late afternoon of an autumn day at the old burying ground in Arkham and speculating about the unnameable. Looking toward the giant willow in the center of the cemetery whose trunk has nearly engulfed an ancient illegible slab, I had made a fantastic remark about the spectral and unmentionable nourishment which the colossal roots must be sucking in from the hoary charnel earth. When my friend chided me for such nonsense, and told me that since no interments had occurred there for over a century, nothing could possibly exist to nourish the tree in other than an ordinary manner. Besides, he added, my constant talk about unnameable and unmentionable things was a very puerile device, quite in keeping with my lowly standing as an author. I was too fond of ending my stories with sights or sounds which paralyzed my hero's faculties and left them without courage, words, or associations to tell what they had experienced. We know things, he said, only through our five senses, or our religious intuitions. Wherefore, it is quite impossible to refer to any object or spectacle which cannot be clearly depicted by the solid definitions of fact or the correct doctrines of theology, preferably those of the Congregationalists, with whatever modifications tradition and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle may supply. With this friend, Joel Manton, I had often languidly disputed, he was principal of the East High School, born and bred in Boston and sharing New England's self-satisfied deafness to the delicate overtones of life. 
it was his view that our only normal, objective experiences possess any aesthetic significance, and that it is the province of the artist not so much to rouse strong emotion by action, ecstasy, and astonishment as to maintain a placid interest and appreciation by accurate, detailed transcripts of everyday affairs. Especially did he object to my preoccupation with the mystical and the unexplained, for although believing in the supernatural much more fully than I, he would not admit that it is sufficiently commonplace for literary treatment, that a mind can find its greatest pleasure in escapes from the daily treadmill and in original and dramatic recombinations of images usually thrown by habit and fatigue into the hackneyed patterns of actual existence, was something virtually incredible to his clear, practical, and logical intellect. With him, all things and feelings had fixed dimensions, properties, causes, and effects. And although he vaguely knew that the mind sometimes holds visions and sensations of far less geometrical, classifiable, and workable nature, he believed himself justified in drawing an arbitrary line and ruling out of court all that cannot be experienced and understood by the average citizen. Besides, he was almost sure that nothing can be really unnameable. It didn't sound sensible to him. Though I well realize the futility of imaginative and metaphysical arguments against the complacency of an orthodox sun-dweller, something in the scene of this afternoon colloquy moved me to more than usual contentiousness. The crumbling slate slabs, the patriarchal trees, and the centuried gambrel roofs of the witch-haunted old town that stretched around all combined to rouse my spirit in defense of my work, and I was soon carrying my thrusts into the enemy's own country. It was not, indeed difficult to begin a counterattack, for I knew that Joel Manton actually half-clung to many old wives' superstitions, which sophisticated people had long outgrown. Beliefs in the appearance of dying persons at distant places, and in the impressions left by old faces on the windows through which they had gazed all their lives. To credit these whisperings of rural grandmothers, I now insisted, argued a faith in the existence of spectral substances on the earth, apart from and subsequent to their material counterparts. It argued a capability of believing in phenomena beyond all normal notions. For if a dead man can transmit his visible or tangible image half across the world, or down the stretch of the centuries, how can it be absurd to suppose that deserted houses are full of queer, sentient things, or that old graveyards teem with the terrible, unbodied intelligence of generations? And since spirit in order to cause all the manifestations attributed to it, cannot be limited by any of the laws of matter, why is it extravagant to imagine psychically living dead things in shapes, or absences of shapes, which must for human spectators be utterly and appallingly unnameable? Common sense, in reflecting on these subjects, I assured my friend with some warmth, is merely a stupid absence of imagination and mental flexibility. Twilight had now approached, but neither of us felt any wish to see speaking. Manton seemed unimpressed by my arguments, and eager to refute them, having that confidence in his own opinions which had doubtless caused his success as a teacher whilst I was too sure of my ground to fear defeat. The dusk fell, and lights faintly gleamed in some of the distant windows, but we did not move. 
Our seat on the tomb was very comfortable, and I knew that my prosaic friend would not mind the cavernous rift in the ancient root-disturbed brickwork close behind us, or the utter blackness of the spot brought by the intervention of a tottering, deserted, seventeenth-century house between us and the nearest lighted road. There in the dark, upon that riven tomb by the deserted house, we talked on about the unnameable, and after my friend had finished his scoffing, I told him of the awful evidence behind the story at which he had scoffed the most. My tale had been called The Attic Window, and appeared in the January 1922 issue of Whispers. In a good many places, especially the South and the Pacific Coast, they took the magazines off the stands at the complaints of silly milksops. But New England didn't get the thrill, and merely shrugged its shoulders at my extravagance. The thing, it was averred, was biologically impossible to start with. Merely another of those crazy country mutterings which Cotton Mather had been gullible enough to dump into his chaotic Magnalia Christi Americana, and so poorly authenticated that even he had not ventured to name the locality where the horror occurred. And as to the way I amplified the bare jotting of the old mystic, that was quite impossible and characteristic of a flighty and notional scribbler. Mather had, indeed, told of the thing as being born, but nobody but a cheap sensationalist would think of having it grow up, look into people's houses at night, and be hidden in the attic of a house, in flesh and in spirit, till someone saw it at the window centuries later and couldn't describe what it was that turned his hair gray. All this was flagrant trashiness, and my friend Manton was not slow to insist on that fact. Then I told him what I had found in an old diary kept between 1706 and 1723, unearthed among family papers not a mile from where we were sitting. That, and the certain reality of the scars on my ancestor's chest and back which the diary described— I told him, too, of the fears of others in that region, and how they were whispered down for generations, and how no mythical madness came to the boy who in 1793 entered an abandoned house to examine certain traces suspected to be there. It had been an eldritch thing. No wonder sensitive students shudder at the Puritan age in Massachusetts. So little is known of what went on beneath that surface, so little yet such a ghastly festering as it bubbles up putrescently in the occasional ghoulish glimpses. The witchcraft terror is a horrible ray of light on what was stewing in men's crushed brains, but even that is a trifle. There was no beauty, no freedom, we can see that from the architectural and household remains, and the poisonous sermons of the cramped divines. And inside that rusted iron straitjacket lurked gibbering hideousness, perversion and diabolism. Here truly was the apotheosis of the unnameable. Cotton Mather, in that demoniac sixth book, which no one should read after dark, minced no words as he flung forth his anathema, stern as a Jewish prophet and laconically unamazed as none since his day could be, he told of the beast that had brought forth what was more than beast but less than man, the thing with the blemished eye, and of the screaming drunken wretch that they hanged for having such an eye. This much he baldly told, yet without a hint of what came after. Perhaps he did not know, or perhaps he knew and did not dare to tell. 
Others knew, but did not dare to tell. There is no public hint of why they whispered about the lock on the door to the attic stairs in the house of a childless, broken, embittered old man who had put up a blank slate slab by an avoided grave, although one may trace enough invasive legends to curdle the thinnest blood. It is all in that ancestral diary I found. All the hushed innuendos and furtive tales of things with a blemished eye seen at windows in the night or in deserted meadows near the woods. Something had caught my ancestor on a dark valley road, leaving him with marks of horns on his chest and of ape-like claws on his back. And when they looked for prints in the trampled dust, they found the mixed marks of split hooves and vaguely anthropoid paws. Once a post rider said he saw an old man chasing and calling to a frightful, loping, nameless thing on Meadow Hill in the thinly moonlit hours before dawn. And many believed him. Certainly there was strange talk one night in 1710, when the childless, broken old man was buried in the crypt behind his own house in sight of the blank slate slab. They never unlocked that attic door, but left the whole house as it was, dreaded and deserted. When noises came from it, they whispered and shivered and hoped that the lock on the attic door was strong. Then they stopped hoping when the horror occurred at the parsonage, leaving not a soul alive or in one piece. With the years, the legends take on a spectral character. I suppose the thing, if it was a living thing, must have died. The memory had lingered hideously, all the more hideous because it was so secret. During this narration, my friend Manton had become very silent, and I saw that my words had impressed him. He did not laugh as I paused, but asked quite seriously about the boy who went mad in 1793, and who had presumably been the hero of my fiction. I told him why the boy had gone to that shunned, deserted house, and remarked that he ought to be interested since he believed that windows retained latent images of those who had sat at them. The boy had gone to look at the windows of that horrible attic because of tales of things seen behind them and had come back screaming maniacally. Manton remained thoughtful as I said this, but gradually reverted to his analytical mood. He granted, for the sake of argument, that some unnatural monster had really existed, but reminded me that even the most morbid perversion of nature need not be unnameable or scientifically indescribable. I admired his clearness and persistence and added some further revelations I had collected among the old people. Those later spectral legends I made play related to monstrous apparitions more frightful than anything organic could be. Apparitions of gigantic bestial forms, sometimes visible and sometimes only tangible, which floated about on moonless nights and haunted the old house, the crypt behind it, and the grave where a sapling had sprouted beside an illegible slab. Whether or not such apparitions had ever gored or smothered people to death, as told in uncorroborated traditions, they had produced a strong and consistent impression, and were yet darkly feared by very aged natives, though largely forgotten by the last two generations, perhaps dying for lack of being thought about. Moreover, so far as aesthetic theory was involved, if the psychic emanations of human creatures be grotesque distortions, 
What coherent representation could express or portray so gibbous and infamous a nebulosity as the specter of a malign, chaotic perversion, itself a morbid blasphemy against nature? Molded by the dead brain of a hybrid nightmare, would not such a vaporous terror constitute in all loathsome truth the exquisitely, the shriekingly unnameable? The hour must now have grown very late. A singularly noiseless bat brushed by me, and I believe it touched Manton also, for although I could not see him, I felt him raise his arm. Presently, he spoke. But is that house with the attic window still standing and deserted? Yes, I answered. I have seen it. And did you find anything there, in the attic or anywhere else? There were some bones up under the eaves. They may have been what the boy saw. If he was sensitive, he wouldn't have needed anything in that window glass to unhinge him. If they all came from the same object, it must have been an hysterical, delirious monstrosity. It would have been blasphemous to leave such bones in the world. So I went back with a sack and took them to the tomb behind the house. There was an opening where I could dump them in. Don't think I was a fool. You ought to have seen that skull. It had four-inch horns, but a face and jaw, something like yours and mine. At last I could feel a real shiver run through Manton, who had moved very near, but his curiosity was undeterred. And what about the window panes? They were all gone. One window had lost its entire frame, and in the other there was not a trace of glass in the little diamond apertures. They were that kind, the old lattice windows that went out of use before 1700. I, I don't believe they've had any glass for a hundred years or more. Maybe the boy broke them if he got that far. The legend doesn't say. Manton was reflecting again. I'd like to see that house, Carter. Where is it? Glass or no glass, I must explore it a little. And the tomb where you put those bones and the other grave without an in inscription. The whole thing must be a bit terrible. You did see it, until it got dark. My friend was more wrought upon than I had suspected, for at this touch of harmless theatricalism, he started neurotically away from me and actually cried out with a sort of gulping gasp, which released a strain of previous repression. It was an odd cry, and all the more terrible because it was answered. For as it was still echoing, I heard a creaking sound through the pitchy blackness, and knew that a lattice window was opening in that accursed old house beside us. And because all the other frames were long since fallen, I knew that it was the grisly glassless frame of that demoniac attic window. Then came a noxious rush of noisome, frigid air from that same dreaded direction, followed by a piercing shriek just beside me on that shocking, rifted tomb of man and monster. In another instant, I was knocked from my gruesome bench by the devilish thrashing of some unseen entity of titanic size but undetermined nature, knocked sprawling on the root-clutched mold of that abhorrent graveyard, while from the tomb came such a stifled uproar of gasping and whirring that my fancy peopled the rayless groom with miltonic legions of the misshapen damned. There was a vortex of withering, ice-cold wind, and then the rattle of loose bricks and plaster, but I had mercifully fainted before I could learn what it meant. Manton, though smaller than I, is more resilient for we opened our eyes at almost the same instant, despite his greater injuries. Our couches were side by side, and we knew in a few seconds that we were in St. Mary's Hospital. 
attendants were grouped about in tense curiosity, eager to aid our memory by telling us how we came there. And we soon heard of the farmer who had found us at noon in a lonely field beyond Meadow Hill, a mile from the old burying ground, on a spot where an ancient slaughterhouse is reputed to have stood. Manton had two malignant wounds in the chest, and some less severe cuts or gougings in the back. I was not so seriously hurt, but was covered with welts and contusions of the most bewildering character, including the print of a split hoof. It was plain that Manton knew more than I, but he told nothing to the puzzled and interested physicians till he had learned what our injuries were. Then he said we were the victims of a vicious bull, though the animal was a difficult thing to place and account for. After the doctors and nurses had left, I whispered an awestruck question. Good God, Manton! But what was it? Those scars, was it like that? And I was too dazed to exult when he whispered back a thing I had half expected. No, it wasn't that way at all. It was everywhere. A gelatin, a slime, yet it had shapes. A thousand shapes of horror beyond all memory. There were eyes, and a blemish. It was the pit, the maelstrom, the ultimate abomination. Carter, it was unnameable. Welcome back, kitties! Now, I suppose I could make some sort of wisecrack regarding unmentionables. Uh, for the kittens who are too young to understand, that used to be slang for underwear. But instead, I must say that this story was a rather clever disguise of a defense of Lovecraft's writing style. And indeed, his personal favorite tropes of the horror genre. In fact, the character of Joel Manton was based on one of Lovecraft's own school teachers. Well, now you know something new today. Doesn't that make you feel special? Moving forward. We return to the Dreamlands with these next two stories, the first of which involves a man who can only visit the Dreamlands in, well, his dreams, and seeks out the city he first glimpsed during his childhood, the mystical coastal city of Celebrate. In a dream, Curanus saw the city in the valley, and the sea coast beyond, and the snowy peak overlooking the sea, and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward the distant regions where the sea meets the sky. In a dream, it was also that he came by his name of Curanus, for when awake he was called by another name. Perhaps it was natural for him to dream a new name, for he was the last of his family, and alone among the indifferent millions of London. So there were not many people to speak to him and remind him who he had been. His money and lands were gone, and he did not care for the ways of people about him, but preferred to dream and write of his dreams. What he wrote was laughed at by those to whom he shewed it, so that after a time he kept his writings to himself and finally ceased to write. The more he withdrew from the world about him, the more wonderful became his dreams, and it would have been quite futile to try to describe them on paper. Curanus was not modern, 
and did not think like others who wrote. Whilst they strove to strip from life its embroidered robes of myth and to shew in naked ugliness the foul thing that is reality, Curanus sought for beauty alone. When truth and experience failed to reveal it, he sought it in fancy and illusion and found it on his very doorstep amid the nebulous memories of childhood tales and dreams. There are not many persons who know what wonders are open to them in the stories and visions of their youth. For when, as children, we listen and dream, we think but half-formed thoughts. And when, as men, we try to remember, we are dulled and prosaic with the poison of life. But some of us awake in the night with strange phantasms of enchanted hills and gardens, of fountains that sing in the sun, of golden cliffs overhanging murmuring seas, of plains that stretch down to sleeping cities of bronze and stone, and of shadowy companies of heroes that ride comparisoned white horses along the edges of thick forests and then we know that we have looked back through the ivory gates into that world of wonder which was ours before we were wise and unhappy. Karanis came very suddenly upon his old world of childhood. He had been dreaming of the house where he was born, the great stone house covered with ivy where thirteen generations of his ancestors had lived, and where he had hoped to die. It was moonlight, and he had stolen out into the fragrant summer night through the gardens, down the terraces, past the great oaks of the park, and along the long white road to the village. The village seemed very old, eaten away at the edge, like the moon which had commenced to wane. And Karanis wondered whether the peaked roofs of the small houses hid sleep or death. In the streets were spears of long grass, and the window panes on either side were either broken or filmily staring. Curanus had not lingered, but had plodded on as though summoned towards some goal. He dared not disobey the summons for fear it might prove an illusion, like the urges and aspirations of waking life which do not lead to any goal. Then he had been drawn down a lane that led off from the village street toward the channel cliffs, and had come to the end of things, to the precipice and the abyss where all the village and all the world fell abruptly into the unechoing emptiness of infinity, and where even the sky was empty and unlit by the crumbling moon and the peering stars. Faith had urged him on, over the precipice and into the gulf, where he had floated down, 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 past dark, shapeless, undreamed dreams, faintly glowing spheres that may have been partly dreamed dreams, and laughing winged things that seemed to mock the dreamers of all the worlds. Then a rift seemed to open in the darkness before him, and he saw the city of the valley, glistening radiantly far, far below, with a background of sea and sky, and a snow-capped mountain near the shore. Curanus had awaked the very moment he beheld the city, yet he knew from his brief glance that it was none other than Selefe, in the valley of Uoth Nargai, beyond the Tanarian hills, where his spirit had dwelt all the eternity of an hour one summer afternoon very long ago, when he had slipped away from his nurse and let the warm sea breeze lull him to sleep as he watched the clouds from the cliff near the village. 
He had protested then, when they had found him, waked him, and carried him home, for just as he aroused, he had been about to sail in a golden galley for those alluring regions where the sea meets the sky. And now he was equally resentful of awaking, for he had found his fabulous city after forty weary years. But three nights afterward, Coranus came again to Selefe. As before, he dreamed first of the village that was asleep or dead, and of the abyss down which one must float silently. Then the rift appeared again, and he beheld the glittering minarets of the city, and saw the graceful galleys riding at anchor in the blue harbor, and watched the ginkgo trees of Mount Aran swaying in the sea breeze. But this time he was not snatched away, and like a winged bean settled gradually over a grassy hillside till finally his feet rested gently on the turf. He had indeed come back to the valley of Uoth Nargai and the splendid city of Selefe. Down the hill, amid scented grasses and brilliant flowers, walked Curanus. Over the bubbling Naraxa, on the small wooden bridge where he had carved his name so many years ago, and through the whispering grove to the great stone bridge by the city gate. All was as of old, nor were the marble walls discolored, nor the polished bronze statues upon them tarnished. And Coranus saw that he need not tremble lest the things he knew be vanished. For even the sentries on the ramparts were the same, and still as young as he remembered them. When he entered the city, past the bronze gates and over the onyx pavements, the merchants and camel drivers greeted him as if he had never been away. And it was the same at the turquoise temple of Nath Horthath where the orchid-wreathed priests told him that there is no time in Uoth Nargai, but only perpetual youth. Then Kiranis walked through the Street of Pillars, to the seaward wall where gathered the traders and sailors, and strange men from the regions where the sea meets the sky. There he stayed long, gazing out over the bright harbor where the ripples sparkled beneath an unknown sun, and where rode lightly the galleys from far places over the water. And he gazed also upon Mount Aran, rising regally from the shore, its lower slopes green with swaying trees and its white summit touching the sky. More than ever, Curanus wished to sail in a galley to the far places which he had heard so many strange tales, and he sought again the captain who had agreed to carry him so long ago. He found the man, a thief, sitting on the same chest of spices he had sat upon before, and a thief seemed not to realize that any time had passed. Then the two rode to a galley in the harbor, and giving orders to the oarsmen, commenced to sail out into the billowy Serenarian Sea that leads to the sky. For several days they glided undulatingly over the water, till finally they came to the horizon where the sea meets the sky. Here the galley paused, not at all, but floated easily in the blue of the sky among the fleecy clouds tinted with rose. And far beneath the keel, Coranus could see strange lands and rivers and cities of surpassing beauty spread indolently in the sunshine which seemed never to lessen or disappear. At length, a Theb told him that their journey was near its end, and that they would soon enter the harbor of Seranian, 
the pink marbled city of the clouds, which is built on the ethereal coast where the west wind flows into the sky. But as the highest of the city's carven towers came into sight, there was a sound somewhere in space, and Karanis awaked in his London garret. For many months after that, Karanis sought the marvelous city of Selafe and its sky-bound galleys in vain. And though his dreams carried him to many gorgeous and unheard-of places, no one whom he met could tell him how to find Oath Nargai beyond the Tenarian hills. One night, he was flying over dark mountains, where there were faint, lone campfires at great distances apart, and strange, shaggy herds with tinkling bells on the leaders. And in the wilder parts of this hilly country, so remote that few men could ever have seen it, he found a hideously ancient wall or causeway of stone zigzagging along the ridges and valleys, too gigantic ever to have risen by human hands, and of such a length that neither end of it could be seen. Beyond that wall, in the gray dawn, he came to a land of quaint gardens and cherry trees. And when the sun rose, he beheld such beauty of red and white flowers, green foliage and lawns, white paths, diamond brooks, blue lakelets, carven bridges, and red-roofed pagodas, that he for a moment forgot Selafe in sheer delight. But he remembered it again when he walked down a white path toward a red-roofed pagoda and would have questioned the people of that land about it had he not found that there were no people there, but only birds and bees and butterflies. On another night, Karanis walked up a damp stone spiral stairway endlessly and came to a tower window overlooking a mighty plain and river lit by the full moon. And in the silent city that spread away from the river bank, he thought he beheld some feature or arrangement which he had known before. He would have descended and asked the way to Oath Nargai had not a fearsome aurora sputtered up from some remote place beyond the horizon, shewing the ruin of antiquity of the city and the stagnation of the reedy river and the death lying upon that land as it had lain since King Kynaratholus came home from his conquests to find the vengeance of the gods. So Karanis sought fruitlessly for the marvelous city of Selafe and its galleys that sailed to Soranian in the sky. Meanwhile, seeing many wonders and once barely escaping from the high priest not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face and dwells all alone in a prehistoric stone monastery on the cold desert plateau of Lang. In time, he grew so impatient of the bleak intervals of day that he began buying drugs in order to increase his periods of sleep. Hashish helped a great deal, and once sent him to a part of space where form does not exist, but where glowing gases study the secrets of existence. And a violet-colored gas told him that his part of space was outside what he had called infinity. The gas had not heard of planets and organisms before, but identified Kiranis merely as one of the infinity where matter, energy, and gravitation exist. Kiranis was now very anxious to return to Mirinette studded Selafe and increased his dosages of drugs, but eventually he had no more money left and could buy no drugs. Then, one summer day, he was turned out of his garret, 
and wandered aimlessly through the streets, drifting over a bridge to a place where the houses grew thinner and thinner. And it was there that fulfillment came, and he met the cortege of knights come from Selefe to bear him thither forever. Handsome knights they were, astride roan horses and clad in shining armor, with tabards of cloth of gold curiously emblazoned. So numerous were they that Coranus almost mistook them for an army, but their leader told them they were sent in his honor, since it was he who had created Oath Nargai in his dreams, on which account he was now to be appointed its chief god forevermore. Then they gave Coranus a horse and placed him at the head of the cavalcade, and all rode majestically through the downs of Surrey and onward to the region where Coranus and his ancestors were born. It was very strange, but as the riders went on, they seemed to gallop back through time. For whenever they passed through a village in the twilight, they saw only such houses and villagers as Chaucer or men before him might have seen. And sometimes they saw knights on horseback with small companies of retainers. When it grew dark, they traveled more swiftly, till soon they were flying uncannily as if in the air. In the dim dawn, they came upon the village which Coranus had seen alive in his childhood, and asleep or dead in his dreams. It was alive now, and early villagers courtesied as the horsemen clattered down the street and turned off into the lane that ends in the abyss of dreams. Coranus had previously entered that abyss only at night, and wondered what it would look like by day. So he watched anxiously as the column approached its brink. Just as they galloped up the rising ground to the precipice, a golden glare came somewhere out of the east and hid all the landscape in its effulgent draperies. The abyss was now a seething chaos of roseate and cerulean splendor, and invisible voices sang exultantly as the knight's entourage plunged over the edge and floated gracefully down past glittering clouds and silvery coruscations. Endlessly down the horsemen floated, their chargers pawing the aether as if galloping over golden sands. And then the luminous vapors spread apart to reveal a greater brightness, the brightness of the city Selefe, and the sea coast beyond, and the snowy peak overlooking the sea, and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward the distant regions where the sea meets the sky. And Karanis reigned thereafter over Oath Nargai and all the neighboring regions of dream and held his court alternately in Selefe and in the cloud-fashioned Seranian. He reigns there still and will reign happily forever, though below the cliffs at Innsmouth, the channel tides played mockingly with the body of a tramp who had stumbled through the half-deserted village at dawn, played mockingly and cast it upon the rocks by ivy-covered Trevor Towers, where a notably fat and especially offensive millionaire brewer enjoyed the purchased atmosphere of extinct nobility. Now I figure one of two things happened there. Either that poor bastard died, or he did in fact have his consciousness ascend to become the ruler of a kingdom of dreams. But let's just say I, I won't be getting any dare sponsorships for some of my personal feelings about his use of drugs to ascend into that mystical realm. 
putting aside anti-drug propaganda from the 80s, our next story is a little more heavy-handed in its metaphor. In fact, all I should need to tell you is its name. I present to you the final story of our episode, a very short one called Ex Oblivion. When the last days were upon me, and the ugly trifles of existence began to drive me to madness like the small drops of water that torturers let fall ceaselessly upon one spot of their victim's body, I loved the irradiate refuge of sleep. In my dreams, I found a little of the beauty I had vainly sought in life, and wandered through old gardens and enchanted woods. Once, when the wind was soft and scented, I heard the south calling, and sailed endlessly and languorously under strange stars. Once, when the gentle rain fell, I glided in a barge down a sunless stream under the earth till I reached another world of purple twilight, iridescent arbors, and undying roses. And once, I walked through a golden valley that led to shadowy groves and ruins, and ended in a mighty wall green with antique vines, and pierced by a little gate of bronze. Many times I walked through that valley, and longer and longer would I pause in the spectral half-light where the giant trees squirmed and twisted grotesquely, and the gray ground stretched damply from trunk to trunk, sometimes disclosing the mold-stained stones of buried temples, and always the goal of my fancies was the mighty vine-grown wall with the little gate of bronze therein. After a while, as the days of waking became less and less bearable from their grayness and sameness, I would often drift in opiate peace through the valley and the shadowy groves, and wonder how I might seize them from my eternal dwelling place so that I need no more crawl back to a dull world stripped of interest and new colors. And as I looked upon the little gate in the mighty wall, I felt that beyond it lay a dream country from which, once it was entered, there would be no return. So each night in sleep, I strove to find the hidden latch of the gate in the ivied antique wall, though it was exceedingly well hidden, and I would tell myself the realm beyond the wall was not more lasting merely, but more lovely and radiant as well. Then one night in the dream city of Zakarian, I found a yellowed papyrus filled with the thoughts of dream sages who dwelt of old in that city, and who were too wise ever to be born in the waking world. Therein were written many things concerning the world of dream, and among them was lore of a golden valley and a sacred grove with temples and a high wall pierced by a little bronze gate. When I saw this lore, I knew that it touched on the scenes I had haunted, and I therefore read long in the yellowed papyrus. Some of the dream sages wrote gorgeously of the wonders beyond the irrepassable gate, but others told of horror and disappointment. I knew not which to believe yet longed more and more to cross forever into the unknown land, for doubt and secrecy are the lure of lures, and no new horror can be more terrible than the daily torture of the commonplace. So when I learned of the drug which would unlock the gate and drive me through, I resolved to take it when next I awaked. 
Last night, I swallowed the drug and floated dreamily into the golden valley and the shadowy groves. And when I came this time to the antique wall, I saw that the small gate of bronze was ajar. From beyond came a glow that weirdly lit the giant twisted trees and the tops of the buried temples. And I drifted on songfully expectant of the glories of the land from whence I should never return. But as the gate swung wider and the sorcery of drug and dream pushed me through, I knew that all sights and glories were at an end. For in that new realm was neither land nor sea, but only the white void of unpeopled and illimitable space. So, happier than I had ever dared hope to be, I dissolved again into that native infinity of crystal oblivion from which the daemon life had called me for one brief and desolate hour. Metaphor for death, right, kitties? No? Yes? Tell you what, discuss this in the comments of either the SoundCloud or the Facebook page or even the website. Might breathe some life into either medium of social media for our little show. Now, next episode should have us telling the last of our Lovecraftian tales for the month. Of course, we will be coming back, but before we do, we shall venture into other stories once more. Should being the operative word. Though before I go, I should also remind you that if you desire to support this show on a more fiscal level, please visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash themadcatter with two teams. Where, for as little as a dollar a month, you can have access to past episodes, special episodes, outtakes, and even get access to new episodes days before their official release. Of course, this show will forever and always be free. But if you wish to support us and help offset our costs, now you know of an affordable method of doing so. Well then, kitties, I am afraid that's all the time we have left. Alas, my friends, the time has come. I am afraid our stories are done. It does appear that we must fly in a silver ship across a starry sky. I shall, however, return next week to tell the stories of which you seek. <laughs> the Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained either via direct permission, the Creative Commons license, or simply by virtue of public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com, as well as Jason White, whose work can be found at SoundCloud.com slash Angels dash of dash Despair. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on Facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hat 
or visit me at www.themadcatter.com. Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams.